Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. We are in the final stretch of theCUBE's live coverage of Cloudera Evolve 24. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside with my co-host and analyst, Bob LaLiberté. One of the things that has been so clear here at Evolve 24 in New York is the importance of ecosystems. We're hearing this messaging from on high on the keynote, and we're hearing it while we talk to guests, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in today's ever increasing disparate and distributed world, it really takes an ecosystem to pull together a comprehensive solution. I see what you did there, Bob. It takes an ecosystem. It takes. IT, takes, IT an e takes an ecosystem. <laughs> With that, I would like to introduce our next guest. He is Abbas Ricky, Chief Strategy Officer at Cloudera. Welcome back to theCUBE, Abbas. You are a CUBE alum, an illustrious CUBE alum. I am, I, I, I have the opportunity to do this during DataWorks Summit a few years back. So thank you for having me back. Well, we're excited to have you. So. You've, you've, you've been at Cloudera a few, for a few years. Before that, you were, you're a veteran of the tech industry as also a consultant. You've had big news this week with NVIDIA and also Snowflake and the AI ecosystem. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about this? We had your, your colleague Priyanka on earlier to talk about the NVIDIA news. I'd love you to just elaborate on, on what, what the news is. Yeah, so just a quick overview of what the enterprise AI ecosystem is. Yeah. So Clatter, as you know, serves the world's largest 14, 2,000 companies. And majority of these large companies have specific requirements around scale, security, governance, authorization, et cetera. So last year we pioneered the enterprise AI ecosystem with AWS Bedrock, NVIDIA, and Pinecone, with the intention being that we can build capabilities jointly to serve our joint customers better. This year we've added more partners namely Google, Anthropic, and Snowflake. And the idea is, AI is a team sport. There are multiple capabilities that you need. You, you need a data platform so that you can do the ingestion, you can do the data prep, you can do the data wrangling, and at that point in time, you can get to a point, you can serve it up after which you need to do RAG applications, fine tuning, prompting, and a host of capabilities. But you also need to leverage the best in class out there in terms of large language models. You need to leverage vector databases. So the purpose of the enterprise AI ecosystem is to work together with these creme de la creme companies out there to be able to get to a prescriptive solution provided by the experts on our sites and their sites to make our joint customers successful. And I do think that that is something that is required because as you guys know, there is a model every Monday, there's a framework every Tuesday, there's new benchmark results every Wednesday. So a lot of our customers are asking us that, hey, can you be a little bit prescriptive in terms of which model to use for which use case? Absolutely. So for us as Clydera in terms of strategy, we're not saying that we will only work with these providers. We do work with a host of other providers and partners as well. Having said that, these are the ones that we have deep integrations with. Yeah. These are the ones that we have a special relationship with. We go to market jointly as well, and therefore you can be a little bit more prescriptive about the needs of the customer. Yeah, and that's so important because so many of the enterprises who want to get into this they're rushing into it, but they may not have the skill sets, they may not understand how things work together. So you coming in with your partners and being able to be prescriptive, being able to give them, this is a tested, validated design, here's how, you, these are the workloads that work in these environments best, et cetera, right, really gives them an advantage for being able to accelerate that time to ROI, which is so critical for organizations now that are making AI investments. Absolutely, and I, I have always said this, a lot of organizations wait to get an ROI sometimes too long. Yeah. AI is one of those technologies where A, it's super capital intensive, as you guys know, but also B, innovation is moving so fast that you cannot wait. Sometimes you have to take the leap of faith. That is one of those times now. And therefore, not only in terms of skill sets and upskilling your practitioners and teams that you have, you almost have to get down into the project development, execution and production rather quickly. And that's where the ecosystem comes into the play because you have validated, tested, authenticated, certified, high security models. You also have hardware tested, accelerated compute, which allows you to run your scale layer workloads on GPUs Right. on a form factor of your choice with the best TCO, but then you also have vector databases, 
for semantic search querying capabilities. So it's a combination of things that all come together that help you to build your RAG, RAG applications or your fine tuning applications in the future. So you mentioned security. I want to dig into that a little bit because there is a growing demand for enterprise AI, but at the same time there is a tension to make sure that you are secure, that you are compliant, that you are um, having good governance, particularly with, I know you work with a range of different companies, but including many that are in highly regulated industries, healthcare, insurance, um, financial services in general. Telco. Exactly, telco. So how do you, how do you um, deal with that tension and how do you address the growing demand for enterprise AI? Yeah, there are a series of capabilities that are embedded into the platform. So we have a product called as SDX, and the idea being, think of that as a data plane. You get a 360 view of all your data assets through a single unified control plane, whether that's for metadata governance, whether that's for lineage, whether that's for provenance, and a host of other capabilities around that. But even insofar as enterprise AI is concerned, the biggest challenge is, can you have access to high fidelity data that you can trust? Because the most important piece is, you have to be able to trust your data that you're going to use to train your models on. And that is one of the core things that we're working with our customers and partners alike. The way we do that is through our Open Data Lake House, which is powered by Iceberg. There are core security features built into that, but even for our AI workbench. So we have two things which the audience might not be aware of. So we have an AI workbench that you can use in a dev environment and that has capabilities like applications, app agents, but it also has multiple studios. So you can have a rack studio, you can have a fine studio, fine tuning studio, you can have a prompting studio that has notebooks, that also has accelerated machine learning projects. Think of them as one click deployments for getting a use case started. So across all of them, there's a core set of operational governance built around that. And we acquired a company called as Verda last year, which helps with model life cycle management and also beefs up our AI operational capabilities around there as well, including governance. But when you get to the production phase, we also have an AI registry. And we also add capabilities from a platform like role-based access control, like fine-grained access control, because you want to be able to understand who touched the data, who played with it, what did they change, what did it actually come out to be, what did it actually look like before, because you want snapshotting capabilities as well, because you want to know what it looks like once that has been used as part of an enterprise AI application or a cloud application there might be. So there are a series of capabilities that we're trying to get to with it. And I do think that the stakes are much higher than it was before because security is a bigger subject. You guys have all seen manifold instances, example, the New York Times article and the copyright use case that we had with OpenAI and everyone else. So it is an increasingly important subject that is coming more and more as part of the discussions and we're looking forward to solving a lot of them. Got it. Yeah, no, that, that sounds great. One of the things I wanted to touch upon when I think about the, the AI ecosystem that you have created, um, clearly there's a hybrid component to that. And we heard at the keynote this morning, massive growth in cloud, right? Your, your solution being adopted in the cloud, but also on-prem. And what we're seeing is somewhat of a reflection of that. This year you added Google, but you also added uh, Anthropic um, and, um, and Snowflake, right? So I wonder if you could touch a little bit on that portion of the hybrid capabilities that your solution has and how that impacts your ecosystem partners that you choose to, to add to it. Absolutely, so there are two parts of the question, so I'll start with the easy one first, which is hybrid. Sorry. I genuinely believe we're the only provider for true hybrid solutions. The definition for true hybrid means you have to write once and deploy anywhere in terms of applications. So application portability. But if you can move your workloads and applications bi-directionally between private cloud and public cloud without application refactoring cost, that's what hybrid means and that's what we're focused on. We've been told multiple times that the cost to refactor an application can be three to seven million dollars per app. Any bank, any telco, they have hundreds of apps, so do the math, and therefore that's something that we're enabling through at the very core of what hybrid means to our customers. Yeah. 
Now, to your second question in terms of ecosystem, maybe it'll be helpful for me to give you a little bit of overview of what the customers do as part of their roles that we have, right? So let's start with the founding partners from last year. So the first one was the AWS Bedrock. The idea was you will be able to leverage any model from Cohero and Tropic leveraging AWS Bedrock service. Yep. Using a single click and clatter machine learning, AKR or AI work pitch. But we also have NVIDIA, whereby we said, hey, we want to do hardware acceleration because if you want to run scale layer workloads on GPUs and a private cloud with the best TCO, you can now do that. And this year with the launch of AI inferencing services using NVIDIA NIMS, you can do this concept of private AI. Yes. But I do want to say private AI doesn't mean doing AI in private cloud. Private AI means being able to deploy your data, your compute in public cloud or private cloud or even a desktop. So your data never leaves for a third party vendor yep. in terms of security and privacy. So then we had Pinecone. Pinecone is largely for semantic search querying capabilities. That was last year. In terms of this year, we've added Google Gemini models from Vertex, Google Vertex platforms. There are more than 150 models of that. There's already a use case AM that we have around document summarization. And we have Anthropic. Anthropic has multiple models. We work with Claude Opus or Claude Sony 3.5 and a host of others. We have a series of assistants, the SQL AI assistant, for example, the CML Copilot, for example. So we're saying we will make the Anthropic Cloud model as the default for our customers going through. That doesn't mean we will not work with other models. We will. It'll just be the default going forward. Got it. And then obviously Snowflake. So for Snowflake, we announced a partnership through the REST catalog. And then the idea being, if I'm an end practitioner leveraging Snowflake today at a customer, I can query any data assets within the Clatter Lake House through the REST catalog, which is powered by Iceberg, which will significantly lower the total cost of ownership for our customers. So that's one part of it. But then Snowflake have also joined the enterprise AI ecosystem because they have their embedding models, the Snowflake Arctic models that are available through NVIDIA NIMS, and therefore they're available through our service, AI inferencing service with NVIDIA as well. So across all of these capabilities, the idea being you want to be able to bring the models to the data and not the data to the models, and that is something that we're making it real because you can now deploy AI applications in a form factor of your choice, but also where the data resides, and that drives security be behaviors as well, which majority of the large customers are looking for. As the chief strategy officer, how do you think about the ethical implications of AI, um, particularly with regard to bias um, and transparency? How do you advise your team on this? How do you advise customers about this? Because this is a topic of growing importance. Correct. I mean, ethical AI, responsible AI, there are multiple terms around it. As we always have said, a model is being trained on a set of data. And the biggest opportunity is to be able to get a high fidelity data set so that you can get a high fidelity output. But that's also an area of concern because the data asset that you're saying, that's where the trust elements comes through. So in terms of your question, how do we advise our teams? How do we advise our customers? We do say that they should be building modern architectures which allow them to be able to expose the data, for example, for those agentic applications, for those AI applications. I'll give you a real example. We have a customer who are already using agents in production. They're doing 70% or more of the LLM calls through agents. And when we were speaking to them, we said, hey, what do you think is the biggest opportunity for us as Cladera? And they said, the biggest opportunity is solving our biggest pain point, which is exposing high fidelity data through Cladera machine learning to our agents. Because they're building agency applications for things like tax invoice reconciliation. They're using vision language models for something as simple as a know your customer use case. But they also have multiple agents doing different tasks, and those tasks those agents are working together with each other, generating more agents. So over a period of time, the quality of data, but also the bias included into that, can have multiplicative effect as you generate more agents, not just regenerate the data as well. So we do want to make sure that you have the processes in place whereby you can have the highest level of authorization capabilities and you have auditing capabilities as well you will have fine grain access control, and eventually that will help you with getting to the high fidelity data that we're talking about. Excellent. Got it, got it, that makes a lot of sense. So one of the things I'm always 
curious when I talk to a strategy officer is obviously, you know, looking forward. And so curious as you're looking out, you've obviously great announcement today. You had to started it last year. Going forward, what are some of the things that, that you're starting to look at to think about who would make a good fit? And I'm not asking you to name names or anything <laughs> or like that. if you want to break some news here today. Yeah, if you want to break some news ahead of time, that's <laughs> fine as well. But you know, when I think about moving forward and you think about the, the LLMs going to SLMs, the agentic AI, things like that that are going on, how do things in, in the markets is moving so fast and the innovations are happening so fast, how does that influence yourself as a strategy officer and where you're looking to make those relationships and bring people onto the ecosystem? I say there are three core categories. One is everyone's building multimodal agents and that pace will only increase. Everyone's doing rag applications and they'll start doing fine tuning very soon if they are not doing that already. So there will be people who can provide agenting workflows in an easy to use fashion. And there will be a category of people who can provide horizontal agenting building capabilities on top of the platform, there will be a breed of providers for that. And no, unfortunately I can't share names just yet, so I'll <laughs> stick to the category, so that's one. The second thing is, I fundamentally believe that majority of the organizations are moving towards a cognitive enterprise. And a cognitive enterprise is similar to having a neural network, but also having the ability to transcribe multiple complex requirements into simple insights, then to value, and then to action. And to be able to do that, one of the core things you need is knowledge bases, because knowledge bases help you with insights. It's not just about the data, you want the knowledge base as well. So there are organizations who are doing knowledge graphs, and I think we're looking to integrate with them, and therefore that could be a second category. And obviously the third one is, there will be more LLM providers. There will be more yeah. infrastructure providers in terms of accelerated compute. Yeah. Right now there are a few that have had ahead of the game, Right now there are a few that are available through services that are not necessarily proprietary and limiting, but over a period of time that will improve, and so will we. So I think across these three categories, we will be looking to add partners, if there's anything else, we'll let you know. <laughs> well, Abbas, we we will we will keep our ears glued to the to the phone. Thank you so much. This Absolutely, was it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me again. I'm Rebecca Knight for Bob LaLiberté. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Cloudera 24. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.